It's my great pleasure to welcome our today's speaker, who's our colleague from Quran Institute, Professor Life Mistra. Uh, Life is physicist by training. He has uh, completed his undergrad in physics at the University of Texas in Austin, where he worked with uh, Harry Sweeney on instabilities of fluid-fluid interfaces. Then he went to Cornell, where he did his PhD in the group of Itai Cohen, who those of you who went yesterday to the CFMR, soft medical seminar, um, met him yesterday. In Itai's group, uh, Life studied the aerodynamics, maneuvering, and stability of insect life. Once he finished his PhD, he already came to NYU, and that's as uh, NSF a postdoctoral fellow when he joined the Applied Math Lab, where he worked together with uh, Jun Jan, Mike Shelley, and Steve uh, Childress. He focused on fluid structure interaction problems, so which range from how swimming fish sense flow to how wind and water create sculptures through um, erosion. Since 2013, he has been assistant professor of mathematics in Quran Institute here at NYU, where he leads an experimental team in the applied math lab that looks into biologically and geophysically motivated fluid dynamics. His work was recently recognized by awards such as American Physical Society's George Welly Prize for early career contributions to fluid dynamics, as well as APS Milton van Dijk Art in Science Award for some of the images and movies, actually, that we will be seeing uh, here today. So without further ado, please. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about some of our work uh, right next door in the Applied Math Lab. And uh, I'll explain some of these images. It, uh, th it's going to be a variety of problems that are all kind of related and all relate to swimming and flying. They're inspired by swimming and flying, especially of big things moving fast. So that's what a high Reynolds number is. And uh, I'll show you that it's not all a mess. There are some nice physics problems in there. So. Um, First, I want to talk about the Applied Math Lab briefly. So um, the AML was founded by Steve Childress, Mike Shelley, and Jun Jong, and I'm the new guy. And all these projects are with all three of these guys also. And uh, we have a big team here. I pointed out some postdocs, grad students, and undergrads who are also involved in these projects. And uh, these come from, the, the students come from math and physics. So. Um, and some of these characters will pop up now and again. Um, OK, so one of our main sort of directions is understanding unsteady flows. So um, as a baseline, let's look at steady aerodynamics. Steady aerodynamics, for example, is the flow around an airplane wing, an airfoil. Uh, the flows are not time dependent, essentially. So uh, they're relatively easier to handle. Um, if you look at a different fright, flight problem, which is insect flight, which uh, is what I studied in grad school. Um, un uh, it's very unsteady in the sense that these wings are beating back and forth very rapidly. You can imagine, you can't see the fluid here, but this, this, is, this is an insect flying in air. Uh, it's creating lots of flows around its wings and certainly slamming back into those flows in complicated interactions. And uh, so this is a movie I got in grad school. It's actually three high-speed uh, video cameras that are filming a fruit fly. It's a few millimeters in size. Uh, this is slowed down. These guys beat their wings 300 times per second. Um, and I've reconstructed the motion on that weird, colorful fly there. So um, we spent a, a long time understanding the aerodynamics of these flapping wings. And uh, it's frustrating because it's so unsteady. It's creating flows and running back into them. And unsteadiness does occur for airplane wings, but we avoid it by not having it stall, so going at low angle of attack or uh, unsteadiness is avoided by simply having the airplane fly so fast that any flow structures which are complicated are kind of left behind. That's not the case around these wings. So um, that was my work, which was you know, working with actual insects. In the applied math lab, our strategy is to take inspiration from these problems, but then abstract them so we can get uh, good mathematical models eventually. So uh, here's sort of our work process flow that we do. We're motivated by some problem, for example, the flight of an insect that beats its wings back and forth as it flies, or birds, or things like this. 
Um, and we blur our eyes and step back and try to isolate what we think are just the simplest ingredients in the problem. So in this case, the motions are complicated, the wing shape is complicated. I'm going to abstract it and I'm going to make the shape nice and simple. It's a disk. And now I'm going to consider the problem of a disk that's flapping back and forth. So that's the flapping motion. And then also moving through the air. So that would be like the body velocity of a forward flying insect or something like that. So um, that's the abstract problem, which basically kind of, I think, hits on the core problem in unsteady uh, flight, is uh, an oscillation on top of a steady motion. So um, that's our abstraction. And then we have to actually realize this in the lab. So that's the final step. And often the realization looks a little different from the abstraction and from the original critter. And so that's what this is. This is an experiment where we have a motor that will flap some disks back and forth. And the whole system is allowed to rotate in air. I'll show you how that all works. And essentially, in this problem, we'll have an imposed flapping. And then the steady motion through the air, this DC speed, as I call it, will actually take the form of a rotation. And this is uh, convenient because then you can run the experiment forever without going anywhere. You can just go in circles. So uh, I mention this now because the rest of my talk, I'm going to have lots of things going in circles. So hopefully you understand the, the motivation for that. Um, OK, so there's no better way than just see the experiment run. So it looks like this. Uh, we have some flapping wings. Uh, they're spinning around. And there's actually a uh, string tied around the base of this and looped over. And a weight is pulling this down okay, to drive the motion. So this whole gadget is actually kind of nice because, OK, now we can pose the flapping. This will reach a terminal rotation speed, which is like the DC speed u, um, at which this applied force comes into balance with the drag on the wing. So I can actually measure the drag with this uh, crazy looking apparatus. Um, and uh, there's a history behind this kind of apparatus. Uh, you, you know about James Prescott Joule, who showed the equivalence of heat and mechanical energy. And he used a similar gadget. So he looped a wire around here, had a weight fall, and uh, had some paddles that stirred up a fluid. And you could measure how much it increased in temperature, supposedly. Although people have questioned whether those experiments were really uh, well done or not. In any case, uh, this was done uh, by Joule. So I call this like a Joule apparatus, this rotational apparatus. Uh, early aerodynamicists also used this kind of apparatus a lot. So yes? Um, we have them oscillate in phase, like this. Um, I think that keeps the forces pretty steady. And so you'll have kind of a smooth running system. Uh, but I wouldn't guess that it uh, would affect any of the results. It's kind of easier to actuate also. So I'd say experimental convenience. Um, OK, who are these other characters? This is one of the earliest aerodynamicists. And he used a similar gadget. He's got a little weight here that's falling. It's going to whirl a wing around. He could measure lift and drag. And these are actually the first experiments to show some basic aerodynamic laws like lift and drag scale with velocity squared. That's a good aerodynamic law that was found in that kind of system. Uh, I'm not sure why he's not happier about the result. But, um, and then this is another guy I like. He's an early aviator. And uh, he used these sort of things to design his uh, gliders that he made. And uh, I like him. He looks very intense. And actually, uh, he is. He died in one of his uh, glider experiments, snapped his spine and died. And he tells his brother before he dies, uh, you know, sacrifices must be made. You know, so, yeah. OK, so that's a, that's a good aerodynamicist. Um, OK, so again, the problem set up is this. We're oscillating these wings back and forth. Uh, this is a uh, flapping speed. You could take it as like the, it's something like the average speed of flapping, twice the peak to peak amplitude times the frequency. Um, and then there's a DC speed. And you have these two speeds. What you can first do is just turn off the flapping. Okay? And you should recover this velocity squared law that uh, people like George Cayley measured on their devices. And so what's plotted here is the drag in the top plot, drag versus the speed through the air. And you get a nice parabola. That's good. Log, log, you get a nice slope two line. So that's steady aerodynamics. You get drag that scales with u squared. Uh, now you can start turning on the flapping motion. So I'll layer in some plots here where I'm increasing the flapping frequency, increasing w. And in the top plot, on the lin-lin plot, you don't see much happening. But on the bottom plot, you see something interesting. 
um, you start to see strong deviations from a squared law here. Um, and in fact, if you look at the data carefully, um, there's sort of two regimes here. One where the drag scales linearly in the flow speed and one where it's quadratic, okay? And we have to figure out what's going on there. And this is a little upsetting to us in aerodynamics because usually when we think of high Reynolds number things, big things moving fast, uh, you get quadratic laws. Here we're getting something that looks kind of linear. And um, of course you do get linear force laws at a low Reynolds number. So when you're small or in a viscous fluid or moving slowly, uh, it's well known that in general forces scale linearly in velocity. Okay? And this is the, the paper which I stole the title of the talk from. This is a paper called Life at Low Reynolds Number that shows when you have a little bacterium moving through water, uh, you know, it's a low Reynolds number and has linear uh, forces in the velocity. For life at high Reynolds number, um, things like insects, birds, these are all high Reynolds number, fish. Uh, inertial forces dominate and typically you get V squared, velocity squared force laws. So to have a linear law is a little weird. We have to figure that out. Um, and the first thing I'll point out is uh, if you look at any one of these given curves, like say the red one here, um, it has this linear scaling and then it turns over and goes to quadratic. And the turnover spot occurs when the DC speed U, the steady speed, matches the flapping speed. So I've marked the flapping speed in different colors here, which correspond to the different curves. And each one, you get that turnover when these speeds match. Okay? So um, what that means is we have sort of a, a steady, what I call a steady regime, where the DC speed U is dominant. It's greater than the flapping speed. And you get quadratic scaling. Slope two, no log log. And then down here is a new regime where you get linear scaling. And that occurs when the DC speed is less than the flapping speed. <coughs> okay, so you get those two. And in fact, uh, the drag is not only linear in the, in the uh, DC speed, it also scales uh, in proportion to the flapping speed. And you can see that by the fact that when I flap harder, my drag force goes up. That's what these colored curves tell you. Uh, you can show it definitively by plotting drag divided by the flapping speed and you'll get collapse of all the data. So it's actually linear in both the speeds. So it goes as the product of the speed. Um, so that's a new drag law that we have to figure out how that comes about. Um, and if you're thinking of animals, uh, what you would think of is sort of, this is a gliding animal. It's moving much faster than it's flapping. This is a hovering animal, which is flapping and barely moving. So it's dominated by the, by the AC flapping speed. Okay, so, um, this is what we're after, and in a series of studies, we've tried to figure out uh, how this works by tying it to the flow structures. So here's some beautiful schematics that June drew, uh, showing a couple of comparisons I'll do here. This is steady flow past a disk, so that'll be a good baseline case. And I'm going to compare that with a disk that's in a flow but flapping. So now the flow is the DC part, and then I have an oscillation speed. And uh, we do these studies not in air but in water because it's a little bit easier. And the uh, images we get uh, look like this. So uh, again, flow coming down. Here's our disk. And you see the high Reynolds number flow, big strong wake there where it's messy, uh, and a nice outer flow. And then when you start flapping, you get new flow structures. Okay. And the flow structures don't pop out too strongly when you do this sort of visualization, which is done by throwing a bunch of little particles into a laser sheet in the fluid, and then uh, you see the flow run there. Uh, to do a better visualization, what you can do is uh, take your, your disc and squirt a fluorescent dye so that it comes out the front of the disc where it hits the flow, and then this fluorescent dye will wash downstream and it'll get entrained into the flow, which is again coming down. And now it's gonna really show you all about the flow that's happening at the edge of the disc. And steady flow looks crazy, even by itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the case of an unsteady motion where you have a moving disk here, uh, it's, it's also beautiful. And you get uh, some vortex rings that curl up here and some interesting little structures here that I'll point out. Um, also, just for fun, I like to uh, show movies of these things so you can really see what's going on. So uh, this is steady flow. The external flow is steady, uh, but even in that case, it's pretty wild. And we don't understand a whole lot of what we're seeing here. But uh, there's some little vortex shedding that are making those little ripples on there and then downstream 
uh, everything uh, goes turbulent and, and crazy, and the and the die buckles around. So that's uh, just a disc where the flow has to be. Disc. Yeah. Or like you sticking your hand out the window of a car when you're driving, it'll look something crazy like that. And is this spacing between these layers related to the flapping? This one is still. This is stationary. Why does it have layers? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there's some little vortex shedding event that is causing the, the flow to come off in a very regular way. And I, yeah, even steady flow is unsteady. We don't really understand. I don't know whether that unsteadiness affects the forces very strongly, but it's there. This is now forced unsteadiness in this case that I'll show you. What's the Reynolds number in the first case? Uh, in all cases, we're around 10 to the 4. So that's like, uh, you know, between the insects, fish, and birds, all in there. So um, dominated by inertial forces. And here I'm going to flap it in the flow. So there's flapping and, and the flow. And you can see some beautiful vortex rings that form off the edge and then run downstream. And in fact, I'll show you that uh, these structures that form on the edge kind of get propelled away from the edge. Um, actually, it's the same. Yeah, same. Yeah, so we can impose the, the flow speed. So we keep it the same in those two and just flap it in the second case. And uh, so there's steady flow there. When you're flapping, you get these interesting little flow structures off, coming off the edge, which are called uh, vortex dipoles or <coughs> dipolar rings. And what they are is there's one little vortex here that's a little runt that's kind of swirling around this way, and a big one, a more intense one here that's swirling around this way. And you can see them again in this image here. So you get these little um, sort of dipoles that represent sort of when the flow jets off the edge, you get these two swirls of fluid that are coming off. And those end up being very important to, all, to describing all the forces. In the first case, are the uh, layer structure related to a vortex size? I think so. I think they're, yeah, I don't know whether there's like a little vortex ring that's coming off, a little tiny, you know, it's obviously tiny compared to these ones, but... Uh, Actually, yeah, I'm not quite sure. I would guess there's a little vorticity that's kind of causing that to, to buckle up, and then you see these nice stripes in there. Um, this is super high flapping speed. So uh, in that case, you still see a little intense vortex pair there, and they shoot off and quickly kind of break up. Um, and this one is more moderate flapping speed. OK, so I'm going to describe is a, um, a little model that will allow you to go from these vortex dipoles to a force law, and in particular, we'll give you the force law that we found experimentally. So the problem set up is basically this. Um, I'm going to make things 2D, so I'll make it a plate that's flapping back and forth with some amplitude and frequency. So there's the flapping speed. It's in a flow. For some reason, I changed the direction on you, and now the flow is coming left to right. Um, and I'm going to zoom in on this little guy and show you what happens, why we get a dipole. What happens is, um, so when you move forward, your disk uh, or plate is moving from left to right. Uh, there's a high relative velocity that goes as the sum of these two velocities, and you get an intense vortex, very strong one. When you go with the flow on the backstroke, you get a weaker one, okay? And so there's a weaker relative velocity and weaker flow there. And these two will team up and form what's called an asymmetric dipole. One intense vortex, one weak one. And um, these vortex dipoles have interesting lives. They um, uh, tend to propel through a fluid, and if they're asymmetric, also turn. So what's shown here is the edge of the disk and purely flapping, no imposed speed, it'll make symmetric dipoles that scored off. And basically there's a jet that comes off the edge of the disk. But when you turn on a flow, you get this asymmetric dipole and those will come off the disk, they'll have a momentum, but they'll also turn. And so you get a curved jet that's coming off the edge. And um, the basic idea for the calculation that we did is if you have a momentum jet, that has a curvature, you can calculate the pressure difference across it that will account for why it's curving. There must be some pressure difference, high pressure out here, low out there. So if you can calculate that pressure difference, then you can wave your hands and say, maybe that's the pressure difference across the body, and then you could compute a force. So that's the outline for the model. Dipoles smeared out into a curved jet and use the curvature and the momentum flux in the jet to find a force. And I'm gonna leave out all the details, but I'll give you a hint a little bit later how they work. Uh, but the main result is that drag scales as the product of these two speeds now uh, from that model. So that's kind of magic right now, but I'll, I'll motivate it in a second. Um, it also points to sort of non-dimensional variables to use in, in the experiment. 
or to, to characterize the experimental data. One is a non-dimensional drag, which is drag divided by u squared, commonly called a drag coefficient. And one is a speed ratio. And if you look at this drag law and the definition of these two non-dimensional variables, you get that the drag coefficient drops as 1 over j. And so what I'll show you now is a drag coefficient versus j. And the way you read this is um, for steady motion, I have a drag, which is here. That's just a measurement, basically. And when I turn on flapping now, I can take data from a bunch of different flapping motions and put it all on there and compare the drag. So that's what this allows us to do. And we see a beautiful collapse of all the data. So this is data at a bunch of different flapping speeds, and they all collapse onto one universal curve. And at uh, low j, you get big drag compared to the steady case. And you actually get a little drag reduction. And then out here, the way you think about this limit is this is when the DC speed dominates as the steady regime. You have basically uh, the drag that's equal to the case when there's no flapping. So that's why this levels off to the dotted line. So um, that's nice. You get a kind of a universal curve describing the drag that even bridges unsteady to the steady regime. And uh, there's our prediction, a little hard to see. CD goes like 1 over J. So I'll plot it uh, CD versus 1 over J. And the, the model here, which has some fudge factors that make it into a band instead of a single curve, um, is right here. And it under predicts the forces just by about 20%. So it does, does very well. And it gets the right scaling. right? It, you get a linear scaling for the forces down there. So that's the way we kind of compare the data. And um, we get this you know, universal drag speed curve. Uh, it also implies that maybe you could modulate the drag on something by vibrating it. So I don't know if that's useful to anybody. But um, that's, uh, that's one idea. And I also have to uh, really thank Natalie, who took all the data that goes into this. So uh, she was in math and physics and just graduated and uh, you know, did the hard work in getting all the numbers. So the um, last thing I'll end on with this is trying to motivate why you get this linear scaling. So I want to give two hokey arguments for it, each of which is incomplete and wrong in some way, but gives the right answer. Um, one is a quasi-steady picture, where what you do is consider the drag on each kind of stroke of the motion. So in one stroke, you're moving uh, sort of against the flow that's coming at you. And so you have a high relative speed. And drag goes like speed squared. And the drag is kind of resisting your motion, so there's a negative sign. And the other half stroke, you're going with the flow, so the drag will look like this. And there's a nice little cancellation that happens here where all the quadratic terms cancel, and you just get the cross terms, w and u. OK. Uh, the problem is it uses kind of uh, steady aerodynamics reasoning for an unsteady situation. So it's, uh, you know, the, the foundation there is a little shaky. OK, but anyway, that's one way to think about it. Uh, the way I like to think about it is instead, I say a flapping object is self-streamlining in a way. And here's the idea. So if you have no flow and you're flapping this thing back and forth, it jets out um, dipoles that shoot out from the wing. And when you turn on the flow, the, the, the sort of jet bends over. And in a way, as you increase the, the flow more and more, it'll curve more and more. And the object actually hides more and more from the flow. Right? It presents a smaller object to the flow. So um, increasing U makes it more streamlined. And in fact, if you kind of say, OK, increasing U uh, makes the area smaller, ends up also actually flapping harder, makes the area bigger. Uh, then you get that kind of scaling for the effective area of the body. And then area times velocity squared is uh, drag. And so you get that same scaling again. So this one, the, the math is all hokey here. But the original picture, I think, is better than, than this one, which has no physical basis, really. So um, OK, those are two incorrect ways to remember the final drag law that you get here. And um, next, we can think about how might insects or flying robots or flying things use this. And uh, in my grad work, I worked a lot on insect flight stability and control. So um, I, I did some cruel and unusual experiments where I would glue a little magnet onto flies. And then I would zap them with a the magnetic field. And so they'd be flying along, and I would redirect their path. And I could see how they recover from that perturbation. And this would be done in living insects in air while they're flying. So here's actually a reconstruction of this experiment happening. 
Uh, I'm going to play a movie, and there's the reconstructed fly. And you're going to see a red uh, arrow come up whenever I twist this guy with the magnetic field to face us. So I zap him. And actually, I turn off the field now. And it coasts to a stop. And then it makes, starts to make a recovery over about 10 wing beats here. And what we found from this data is basically that the body motion was very damped. So if you tried to twist this guy in the air, it would quickly come to a stop. And why would that be? It's because now it's undergoing this combined AC and DC motion. It's flapping, and now you're twisting it. And so there's this big drag that resists the motion. And so we needed to describe these dynamics. We needed uh, a linear drag law that was linear in the body rotation speed. And these experiments show why that is now. So at the time, it was you know, sort of unsatisfying and kind of we needed it to describe the data, and now it makes sense. So uh, in maneuvers also, these guys have to deal with these forces, right? They're flapping their wings. They do cool maneuvers like rapidly turn 180 degrees. That's what's shown here. So uh, this is an insect that's flying, and then suddenly will turn to its right, to her right, I believe. Um, and when it's doing that, it's got to overcome this drag, right? because its wings are oscillating and its body is moving through the air. So uh, it, you know, it could be exploited or perhaps it's uh, detrimental. Maybe it slows down the maneuver. You know. But in any case, the forces are there. Um, we can also try to use this effect to maybe do something useful or dangerous, depending on how you look at it. Um, and that is make flapping wing robots. So uh, in my postdoc, one of the things I played with is making uh, hovering vehicles that use flapping wings. So here's, here's a gadget that does this. And what it is, is it's, uh, I'll show you a movie and you'll see how it works. It kind of uh, pulls its wings in and out and is able to fly. So here's a video of it. Okay. And uh, I'm cheating here. I'm, I'm wiring in the power to the motor that's down there. But otherwise it can fly. And uh, What's happening here is I'm using uh, this drag, basically, because when the wings flap like this, and now it tries to tilt over, there's a big damping of that motion. It can't tilt very easily because this drag is uh, going to resist any rotation of the body. So I'm actually using it to stabilize the body. And so that allows it to do things like hovering, which is very difficult. Usually hovering has stability problems. So if you have lift match body weight, and you turn on the voltage that does that, It'll do this. If you crank up the voltage, you can make it fly upwards. That's the other movie. And basically, because of this effect, its body rotation is very damped. It's high drag. That's linear in the body rotation uh, velocity. So, oh, good point. OK, this guy beats uh, 20 to 25 times per second. So it's slowed down. Yeah, so its wings are a blur when you look at it. It's just a. Uh, um, yeah, it's all a blur, and then you can take a high-speed recording and, and watch it. And this is um, the first uh, stable flapping wing vehicle that is you know, self-stable just with the flapping wings. No added uh, sails or tails or onto it. It just has the flapping wings are the only aerodynamic surface, and that's enough to stabilize it. And that would be within a small angle. If you just turn the thing upside down and turn it on, what would happen? Da-bam! <laughs> yeah. yeah, it would find the ground very quickly. Yeah. Um, so it's stable within some, some range of angles. But it's pretty, you can see from the hovering video, it's pretty, uh, pretty wide range. It's not, not very delicate. OK, so um, that's how you might use this. Uh, any questions on drag laws for flapping? Yeah. So how do you understand, help us understand that the drag coefficient is actually reduced? I think of it as a streamlining. So, I mean, yeah, the, the drag coefficient is getting smaller as you turn up the flow. And that's because when you have this thing that's oscillating, it's spraying out this jet, right? But as you turn up the flow speed, the jet actually becomes more confined. So in a way, the object is hiding more and more from the flow as you turn up the flow speed. So there's a streamlining there. And so that's why the drag coefficient drops. Drops like 1 over u, and the drag is like, 1 over u times u squared. So you get a u dependence for the drag. That's kind of, eh, it's. And that goes away eventually. That goes away as you turn up the, the flow speed more and more, then it turns on to quadratic. Yeah. Yep. Because it still has that length scale of the problem, which is just line size. You can't straight line more than 
Yeah, eventually it'll feel the body and yeah, you're just that big. Yeah. Okay, so um, in, the, in the second half, or however long I have, um, I'll talk some about uh, flapping locomotion that's more relevant to birds and fish. So uh, in the AML, we've done a lot of work uh, relevant to swimming and flying. And again, the zoomed out picture of a, of a fish swimming is basically you have an oscillating structure that's spraying fluid out behind it. And this movie is a little hard to see here, but uh, same thing if you look at a bird wing. It's flapping up and down, and it's flying along, so there's a flow this way. And uh, one of the main features that come about is um, a particular kind of flow structure behind these wings. So this is an oscillating wing that's in a flow, which is equivalent to flying. And uh, you get this nice staggered array of vortices in the wake behind it. So uh, this is called an inverted von Karman wake, or you could think of it as a dipole chain. So basically, remember, a dipole is uh, you know, a vortex and another vortex. Right? Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Vortex going this way, that way. And here, this vortex is sort of a member of this dipole and that one. And there's another one there. Each one uh, is a member of a dipole, and they're kind of linked together into a chain. And uh, so there's lots of good fluid dynamics when you just think about how this uh, flow is formed and the forces on a single wing. I think it gets to be a lot more fun when you have another swimmer behind it. So now it can go and interact with this type of flow. And so that's a problem which is uh, relevant to schools and flocks. So that's what I'll talk about. So obviously when fish are swimming, they're creating these flows. They're very near each other. A uh, similar thing in flocks. And we've done a series of studies where we abstract away from schools and flocks, but hopefully keep some of the basic fluid dynamics the same and uh, try to learn something about how these uh, groups move together. So uh, when we were setting up the original experiments, we wanted a few basic ingredients. This is our abstraction stage. We wanted to drive some impose or impose some flapping motions of swimmers, but we wanted them to uh, swim freely, go on their own. So we impose a flapping motion, but then they can take off and, and move as they wish. And if we're gonna make a uh, mathematician's flock, we want it to be a linear, infinite array of bodies. So you basically have a bunch of these swimmers, they're all flapping, they're all producing flows, and they're all swimming together. And... Mathematician's flock is different from flock of mathematicians. It's very different, yeah. <laughs> the second one's scarier, yeah. So, um, we want, it's, and it sounds like experimentally this is gonna be impossible to do, to have an infinite array. But we exploit a little trick and now our rotational system, our like sort of joule apparatus where you have something moving in a circle comes in handy. So we have a gadget that looks like this where you, having an external motor impose up and down flapping motions of a pair of wings, pair or more if you want. But the main idea is that now these guys swim in circular orbits around the tank and so they run into each other's flows. In fact, you could take a single wing if you wanted, and if it's swimming fast enough, it would run into its own flow and form a school with itself, in a way. Okay, so that's the, the basic setup. Um, and, you know, for example, the orbits would look like this. So in blue is sort of the first pass of a wing, and then red would be the following pass. And the flow structures from the blue orbit would, you know, would be lingering around, and the, in the second pass you could go and interact with it. Um, and so if you're uh, open-minded enough, you would view this as a linear flock. If you unwrap this, it's an infinite linear flock. Or if you're more literal, you could just say it's a fishball like this. So there's these schools that mill around in circles. Okay, so that's a more literal analogy. Okay, um, I want to show a movie of our first experiment on this. This is a dirty version of the experiment. It also has four wings, but it shows something very interesting. So. Um, in this movie, the flapping motion is the same throughout. It's unchanged. But you're going to see my hand come in there and put the system in different initial conditions, different initial speeds, and you'll see something weird. So it can go slow like this if it starts slow. But if you tickle a little bit, it'll snap into a fast mode like this. And so there's multiple different speeds available to it, uh, even for the exact same imposed motion. Um, and so once we saw that, we decided it was exciting enough to make a better system. And so a more clean version you know, looks something like this. Um, you have a motor that's maybe going to be shown in a second that's flapping this thing up and down. 
uh, the wings are on low friction bearings, so they're rotary bearings, so they're allowed to, in a low friction way, just swim in orbits like this. We impose the flapping motion, the swimming speed is a, you know, an emergent quantity, that's what we measure. So that's what the experiment looks like. And um, if you do an experiment with, with a single wing in this sort of gadget, and you measure the speed, maybe in terms of the rotational frequency around the tank, so that would be the swimming speed, versus the flapping frequency, you get a sort of boring curve where it kind of goes up for the most part. It's a straight line. You flap faster, you go faster. Um, and when you start these interacting wings, it looks similar. So here we're incrementing up the frequency, and we fix some amplitude. And it sort of begins to uh, look like a single wing. But then something interesting happens where suddenly it jumps in speed. So you increase the frequency a little bit higher, and suddenly it jumps to a higher speed. And as you come back down in frequency, you come back home, but by a different route. So it looks like that. So Yes, they're, they're locked together. So there's only one rotational frequency. There's only one swimming speed. Yeah. So we're ramping up frequency and ramping it back down. And the flapping frequency and the entire flapping motions are exactly, these are synchronized swimmers, all synchronized together. Yeah. So there's, uh, yep. If you go back down before you have the junction up there, it will follow the original path up. Say again? Well, you reverse the speed, you reverse the... I reverse the flapping frequency, so I'm going to increment up the flapping frequency, and I'm going to climb up, and I'm going to increment it back down. Okay. Yeah, and I'm measuring this for each value of frequency. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you do different amplitudes, in general, the thing goes faster, but the same thing basically happens. You get a bunch of loops like this in the data. So these are different flapping frequencies. I'm lowering the flapping frequency. Okay, and uh, what can we see from this? Well. In the original movie where I was snapping this thing between two different speeds, that's like being here. I'm at the same frequency and amplitude, but I have a lower branch where I'm going slow or an upper branch available to me where I go fast. And if I put it near the, the fast mode, it'll go there. Near the slow mode, it'll go there. I'm kind of tickling it between those two states. Um, okay, so that's the, the basic data. It looks like a lot of good nonlinear dynamics buried in here. So we have two speeds available to us in general. We've got uh, abrupt transitions. So, uh, for example, this transition here is a doubling of the swimming speed, which is pretty crazy to see in the experiment because you increment the flapping frequency up a tiny bit and suddenly the thing goes twice as fast. Um, and we have hysteresis loops, which sort of uh, you know, <coughs> imply some sort of history dependence or memory in the problem that I'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah, there was a... Uh, did you ever get more than two levels? Um, we've only seen two, but I'm not sure that, yeah, uh, that's not allowed. But yeah, so far we've only seen these two, two speeds available to us. But there may be something more complicated out there, depending on what parameter regime you work in. Yeah? Can you make this reasonable way if you could somehow uh, have the, the flapping phase of the meeting one be, or the, the training one be self-adjusting? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought about that. Um, we're just beginning to look at non-synchronized swimmers where we can sort of adjust their motion independently and uh, not, not immediately clear to me whether this would wipe that out or not. Yeah. Um, okay, so and then here again I have to point out Alex who was an undergrad in math and Joel who's here, a physics grad who uh, did the hard work to get this, this data. And there are even error bars on these data plots, but they're very small. Uh, it's, it's very good measurements. Um, okay, so the key to understanding this is that, you know, when one wing passes by and the follower comes behind it, a second one, there's a phase shift between the trajectories. And that phase shift is going to allow us to make sense of basically all the data. So um, the way this works is, well, I'll give you the answer and then I'll kind of justify it. If you look at these two modes, these uh, high speed states and the low speed states on either side of the hysteresis loop, um, the way it works out is that the, the fast mode, where the wings are moving fast, correspond to basically a spatially out of phase motion of the wings, where one wing will go through a given portion of space, <coughs> given fluid, and the follower will come behind it but be out of phase with it. So one wing will do this, will be dipping down at a given site, and the other one will come through the same 
spot a little while later, but be out of phase. And uh, the lower branch of these loops are in phase relationships. Okay, so we get some nice coherent interactions. Um, and to justify all this, we can define what we call a schooling number. And the schooling number is going to encode the distance and the phase very well. So it's, it's a good number. So here you have two swimmers. Um, there's a distance between them, and there's a wavelength of motion through the fluid. This would be like the trajectory of the, of the motion. And if you just measure the distance between swimmers in terms of the wavelength, then you uh, will get something nice where, for example, if you have integer values of the schooling number, you're in phase. Right? You're one wavelength or two wavelengths or three wavelengths back from the guy in front of you. If it's half integer, then you get out of phase. And now if you take all of our data and convert it to a schooling number plot, it looks like this. So for example, the red curve, which was up here, now looks like this. And the way you read this is basically for low flapping frequencies, the data plows through all schooling numbers. And that's because their wings are not interacting strongly. So it doesn't really care about schooling number. Um, and then it'll, when it's interacting strongly, it'll level off on an in-phase state, an integer, here one, and then pop over to an out-of-phase state. And if you look at all of these uh, hysteresis loops, they all do this. So they bracket a gray zone there of excluded phases. It just doesn't like to be in there, so instead it snaps to one of the uh, available modes nearby. So all of that is to say um, there's clearly some sort of uh, oscillator. The wing is an oscillator and a wave that it produces. Uh, there's an interaction between them, and that must be a coherent interaction to get these in-phase and out-of-phase states. And um, in fact, uh, there's sort of an analogy to the Bohr atom in some of these orbits. So if you look at these in-phase states, right, we have integer values, they correspond to, to Bohr orbits where you'd have sort of uh, three wavelengths fitting in an orbit around uh, the nucleus here. So R4, R5, that would be you know, our S equals six. So there's a uh, kind of analogy there because you have a, you know, again, a kind of a uh, oscillator and a wave there. And, um, but overall, it's because of a coherent interaction between the oscillator and the wave. And so we, again, being fluid mechanicians, want to figure out how that works. So did a series of studies to understand the flows around these guys. And uh, a single wing looks like this. Um, this is a movie where, again, in water, I've put a bunch of particles, hit it with a laser sheet, and take an image from the side with a high-speed camera so you can see what's going on. Very difficult to see from the movie we can do what's called PIV to trace the velocity field. And uh, you know, there's lots of details here, but the main thing is when the wing moves up, it creates an upward jet. That's what's red there. When the wing starts to move down, it creates a blue jet downwards. And these two jets are separated by a vortex. So that's what's shown here. So this is the uh, sort of dipole chain or inverted von Karman wake that I mentioned earlier. And when these guys start to interact, uh, the main effect is that the flows are very lively. Um, they're still very uh, strong flows by the uh, leader when the follower comes behind it. So uh, you can kind of see that here. There'll be some strong flows that the next one will run into. And I won't get into the details of the flow because um, I'm actually not sure how much time I have either. Is that clock right? Okay, so I'll, I'll skip this flow viz instead show simulation from Mike's group, which I think show these effects much, uh, much better. So in these simulations, the way we do this is we have a periodic domain. So you have a wing that's going to be flapping and swimming, but it's allowed to sort of uh, pop out the right end and come into the back end here. And by doing that and overrunning this domain several times, it sort of then begins to, to you know, mimic an infinite array, right? It's interacting with its own flow, and now uh, the, instead of having a leader in front of it, it has its own flow it generated in its previous orbit across that domain. And uh, what's colored here is the vorticity. So I'll show you a movie of how this works. And this is in the slow mode. So first of all, in the simulations, we get the slow and fast mode. We get, we get a lot of the dynamics out of it. And you see something beautiful here in the slow mode. Uh, the wing is uh, slaloming between the vortices. That, uh, that it's generated in the previous orbit. So there are red and blue vortices, and it comes in and sheds and contributes to those vortices that are sitting there. So this slow mode is a constructive interaction between the flow and the wing. So wait, this is a periodic boundary? It's 
periodic boundary conditions so that you can run the wing across this domain many times and then it sort of uh, maps onto an infinite array again. And the period is the, what you're showing. That's the entire period. So you see a red vortex or a blue vortex will come out here and go there. And this is in the frame of the wing, so it's a little easier to see. Um, so again, another sign of just like coherent interactions between the flow and the wing. And um, the fast mode has a similar coherence, um, but now the wing uh, does what we call vortex interception. It slams into the vortices and basically destroys them. So that's a destructive flow uh, wing interaction there. But they're all very coherent. Um, so you know, it kind of has a beautiful result in both cases. Um, so we use these simulations and the experiments to cook up a very simple model for this. I'll just briefly go through it. Uh, the idea is that uh, an infinite array of synchronized swimmers can be mapped onto a single self-interacting swimmer. So that's the periodic boundary condition sort of view. And um, we want to write down a little equation that tells us how the speed evolves as a function of some parameter, say the flapping frequency. And of course the flows are very complicated, so I'm going to do something very simple and sort of made up in the end here. And the idea is that uh, if you have a speed that the wing is moving at, that's x dot, uh, it depends on the flapping frequency, say to, with some power law. That's what we see in experiments. You increase the frequency, it goes faster. That's a non-interacting wing. And then if I want to incorporate an interaction, um, I need to add some term that perturbs the speed. And so we made up this term that perturbs the speed. And what it is is a phase-dependent forcing here, where t is the current time, t prime is the time I was last at the same location as I was doing these repeated orbits. And so t minus t prime is how much time has elapsed. And presumably the flows decay. That's what that will do for you. And there's a phase-dependent interaction. So this is uh, the phase difference between now and back then. And uh, otherwise, the signs and the, cos uh, the, the negative sign here and the cosine term, we just made it up to kind of fit the data. So, uh, but I think it has the right spirit for the model. Um, what's nice about it is you can look for steady states and uh, get the schooling number as a function of flapping frequency with it. And you see a beautiful correspondence. So remember how the experimental curves would level off near an integer and then hop over to a half integer? That's what this is showing. The dashed curve is a single wing, how it would look, and it does this. When you put in this interaction term, it uh, forms a fold in the solution curve, and now there's two states. There's your bistability. Um, and we cooked it so that we got uh, states that are integer and half integer by using a negative cosine. So we don't know where that comes from, but we made it up. This story, the beginnings of this model seem to contradict each other because uh, exponential and cosine could have uh, uh, grown out of some linear model, while f to the power p is definitely nonlinear. Um, that's true. Yeah, it's a little bit of a weird model in that sense. This was sort of taken from experiments. We just see sort of a, it's a weak power, by the way. It's like four thirds or something. It's a little bit lit, bigger than one. But this is experimental. Uh, and this is entirely made up. And um, yeah, it'd be nice to find this type of model from like real hydrodynamics. And that's something we're working on. As of now, I think its only utility is really to point out that there's sort of a phase dependent interaction between the wings and sort of a memory. And that's the high Reynolds number effect. So in high Reynolds number, the flows are long lived and uh, that gets incorporated in this term. And so, you know, one swimmer can lay out a flow field and another one can come into it later and get forced according to the information. So that's the memory effect. And um, that's something that happens at high Reynolds number, won't happen at low Reynolds number. So all these hysteresis loops and things are, I think are a good signature of high Reynolds number uh, collective locomotion. And uh, so that's that story. The final thing I'll end on is going from the infinite school to the smallest school. So those previous experiments, I tried to mimic an infinite array of swimmers. And now we're going to go to the smallest school, just two, two swimmers, uh, with the idea being that now we can actually have the spacing between the swimmers now evolve. So in the previous experiments, I forced the swimmers to take on some spacing between them and let them free to swim. And now I get to, uh, by having these wings experimentally on separate rotational bearings, and allow them to choose their spacing, the gap G. 
So now they can choose their speed and their spacing. And uh, we can see what configurations pop out of that. So uh, the experiment looks very similar. We have a pair of synchronized swimmers like this. This is uh, the gadget we actually did the experiment in. It's a smaller version of the previous one. And uh, so there's a motor that drives up and down flapping. And then uh, these wings are on a common support, so they have the same motion, but they're actually on separate bearings. They can move independent of each other. Okay? And it doesn't look like they're moving independent of each other, and that's because there's a weird effect here that locks them into, into position. And so we can see that here. So I'm going to show is a movie from a top view. And when you start out with these swimmers far apart, they kind of don't interact. If you put them near each other, they collide into each other, and they really like to hang out together. But if you slow down the follower a little bit, it goes away, but then locks into a specific position behind the, the leader. If you slow down the follower a little more, it goes to a new position. And finally, if you slow it down, nudge it, and then you let go of it, it goes and finds a third place it likes to see. And so... Yeah, angles are positions, yeah. Yeah, I'll show you some, some more rigorous evidence for that. So um, you can run these experiments where you flap these guys for a long time and see what, speed, what uh, gap and speed they attain. And so if you fixed, say, a given frequency and amplitude for flapping, you would measure, in this case, say, three different positions uh, between the two wings. So that would be the gap here, okay? So I could start it out here, and if I kicked it to a higher one, it would go there. Kicked it to a further distance, it would go there. Uh, we haven't been able to see a fourth one. But we saw three so far. Um, and then if you vary the amplitude, then you'll get different gaps. So you get different curves like that. And then if you vary the frequency, you get entirely different curves. Okay. So the main thing is there are these discrete positions that it takes up, but they obviously depend on the amplitude and frequency in some way. So it looks like that. And um, by the way, we're measuring speed the whole time. But speed ends up being a slightly less interesting variable. So it's plotted down here. And uh, all this is saying is that, for example, if I go to uh, 4 hertz flapping frequency, basically all the data hit on each other like that, regardless of which position they're in. The swimming speed is basically the same. But it's not quite the same. Uh, in fact, you can compare it to a single swimmer swimming in isolation at the same kinematic parameters. And you get something like this, a little speed increase, like 20%. Okay, So there's a little boost in speed because these guys are interacting with each other. But the main effect is they lock into specific configurations behind each other. Um, OK, so that's what we want to make sense of. And here's where the schooling number helps out a lot. So again, we can define the schooling number, which is the gap divided by the wavelength, how far they are separated in units of the wavelength of their flapping motion. Uh, we measure G, we measure U, those are outcomes. We impose F, flapping frequency. And so we can take the same data and, and plot this. And you get a beautiful collapse like this. So here is the closest state where they like to hang out close to each other. Here's the further one and the further one. We've been able to see three so far. And what's beautiful is in this variable, this schooling number, you get integers. Right? So that's nice. And what does that mean? It means they're locking into these configurations where the follower is one wavelength behind the leader that's here, or two wavelengths, or three. Okay, so that's the right way to sort of view the, all the data. And um, I have to mention here that Sophie, who's a postdoc with us, did all the hard work to get this data. Um, okay, so the uh, story is the same from here. We try to figure out what's in the flows to make sense of these quantized configurations. And uh, basically what we see, I don't know how well you can see it, is that the follower rams into the uh, vortices shed by the leader. So the, the leader sprays out this uh, vortex chain, and uh, maybe a static image is a little easier to see. Uh, it'll, a swimmer in isolation lays out this vortex chain, and the follower will come, and it'll ram its nose through the core of the vortices. So it's something like the vortex interception mode that seems to pop out of this system. And that's an emergent thing. That's, you know, we didn't impose the separation of the speed. So this is what the system went to on its own. Um, OK, so the final thing I'll end on is um, you know, trying to understand 
these forces of interaction by actually perturbing this school. And so the idea is this, uh, you have a leader here in gray and uh, a follower who likes to send, set uh, one wavelength back. Um, and if I want to map out this, this interaction between these guys, I can try to push the follower closer to the leader and measure the resistive force that the fluid imparts on it to try to make it return. So I can basically nudge the follower around and map out the hydrodynamic force it feels. And we use a Joule apparatus to do this. So it looks like this. You have a leader here, and it's on its own bearing, so it's going to swivel relative to everything else on its own. And uh, we pull on the shaft that uh, the follower is mounted to. And so if you apply a torque one way, you can nudge them closer together. You apply a torque the other way, you can pull them further apart. And now you get to map out the landscape between them. And so what you get when you do that is, um, say, let's put uh, the follower in the S equals 1 configuration. And then if you don't apply any force, zero force, it'll sit there. That's the equilibrium state. And then you can apply a force that will tend to push them closer together. So I'll try and nudge the, uh, the follower into the leader. And when I do that, they'll come closer together, so the gap will decrease. And uh, it'll take me some force to do that, which will go up like this. This is now not the applied force. This is the force that the fluid is imparting. Uh, the applied force would be opposite signed. But um, this is now the hydrodynamic force. So it would look like that. If I applied the force the other way, it would look like this. And so what you get is a beautiful Hookean spring, right? This is F equals negative kx, where F I've non-dimensionalized somehow. And uh, x, or non-dimensional distance, is the schooling number. And so you get this uh, f equals negative kx. So that's the spring that tends to keep it uh, in that locked mode. Um, if you look at the other positions behind it, you get something similar. So uh, around the uh, s equals 2 mode, you'll have a spring, but apparently it's weaker. k is smaller. Uh, and uh, likewise for the third one. And apparently the uh, fourth one is so weak that we couldn't see it. So, um, and if you look at this, it looks like there's sort of a sinusoidally varying and decaying force downstream. Okay, so that's what that curve drawn through there is. Um, and what's nice about that is you can take this data and then integrate it up to actually form a potential which tells you about the interaction between these guys. So when we do a potential, we do negative integral of a force dx. This is the non-dimensional version of that. And now you can actually map out a potential between these guys, and you get something like this. So when you integrate that data, you get this nice well that defines the stability in the first configuration, the second, and the third. And what you can now see is, um, for example, the fourth looks like it's going to be so weak that we won't be able to measure it, and we weren't. And you can also now explain why the two wings collapsed together when they were very close, right? Because there's a big potential well here that drives them together. And so they like to be next to each other. Um, and this is, you know, the, now each of these configurations, you can measure how robust that configuration is. Yeah? In light of this data you've shown here, does that help you understand actual flocking of birds and stuff in, in nature? Um, we, we hope so, yeah. So that's what we're beginning to think about. We've, we've looked at sort of the simplest flocks that we can think of, uh, infinitely long one and then just two. Um, and now we'd like to try to use this to understand something about real schools and flocks. And that's going to be hard, obviously. The data, we're not going to take it, and we hope someone else will. Um, but hopefully these things like the schooling number will be useful in kind of telling, telling us whether flows are important in organizing a school or flock. Um, and that's sort of where we're going with this, um, is uh, kind of revisiting an old idea that uh, James Lighthill had, fluid mechanician, uh, that basically a school or flock is sort of like a crystal, in the sense that once a uh, school starts to swim very fast, the, the flows are very strong, and uh, they will lock into set configurations. And um, I also like this picture of James, because it looks like he's in a strong wind all the time. Uh, <laughs> So that's kind of where we're going with it. And um, in that direction, there are some very kind of old uh, but very well-cited uh, models of schools and flocks. For example, there is a kind of a famous work on V-formation flight 
and uh, sort of a crystal of fish, a school is a crystal of fish. And we're, we're hoping to be able to reassess you know, whether those ideas uh, make sense or not. So that's, that's where we're heading from here. And I will end there and take any questions. They don't. So that's a big complication is that the temporal phase is different, right, for uh, members of a flock. So we have to figure out how uh, that will modify everything. And so we're working on that. We now have a system where we can have multiple swimmers that have different phases. And in fact, have different amplitudes or frequencies or anything you want. So I'll be able to explore that. Could you go back to slides for the place of nice Fukin's previous slide? Yes. Yep. It seems to me that your minima uh, of the Island there systematically to the right of corresponding quote unquote quantized numbers. Yeah, so the, the I think it's pretty definitive in our data that the uh, stable modes are not exactly integers. So why? And we don't understand that. Uh, so because you gave so nice I know. I know. Be. Yeah. I, uh, I gave a clean, clean version of it. Yeah, they're a little bit off, and we don't understand why. And we're also trying to figure out a model where we have wings that are swimming in these kind of arrangements of vortices to explain why they would lock there. And maybe we're using the wrong schooling number. Maybe we need something else. Uh, there should be some variable, I feel, that becomes integers when uh, you do things properly. But we don't understand enough about the problem to, to do that yet. Oh, if I could add to your comment. I tend to think the reason that the schooling number is slightly higher than the integer values is because when the stable schooling happens, the thrust and the drag are balanced, and then the friction from the bearing comes into play. And so we see as we add a force, it can shift the schooling number slightly over. So when the thrust and the drag are balanced, the fluid forces are balanced, the friction from the axle actually starts to play a role although it's usually very small. So that slightly pushes the follower downstream. So you're saying that natural birds, which don't care to carry this heavy piece of metallic equipment, they will do it right. Yes. <laughs> they don't have rotational bearings. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much. Let's continue this discussion upstairs with Brian.